Айде, аз съм Таско от Комузика. Това е един специален епизод, който е допълнение към материалите, включени в учебниците по музика. Така, например, в 6-ти клас имаме посещение или наблюдение в звукозаписното студио, а всички знаем, че това, особено в провинцията, трудно може да се осъществи. Да вземем всички 6-ти класове и да ги заведем в звукозаписното студио за това. Аз свързах се с Рема Стиерс, който беше така любен да ме покани в неговото домашно звукозаписно студио и направихме този филм. Ще видите много интересни неща, например лентов магнитофон, 8 пистов, на който той записва и различни инструменти, които използва. Това е допълнение към урок, който направих и преди време, когато бях в Дания и взех интервю от Томи Хенсен, който е продуцент на рок група Хелоин и ме въвери в неговото голямо звукозаписно студио. Така че остава да направим един образователен урок в студио, където е концентрирано само около компютъра. Говори се на английски през цялото време, но се надявам ви да го разберете. Приятно гледане! This is my, this is just part of my drum set, but it's not a very good drum set. I just have a drum set to learn because I'm not a very good drummer. But this is where we record drums. And we took most of my set downstairs and because the Mace Hunters were here and we had, and the drummer has a really good drum set. And then we would just bring up things like an extra snare. This is actually a marching snare. You can see because it doesn't have the regular square lugs, and this is like a marching band snare, and has more of a snap to it. So for recording it sounds good, and sometimes you'll put another snare over to the side of the drummer's regular snare during recording so that um, he's playing, and he might be playing the verse, and then he goes to the chorus, he might play on a different snare in the chorus because he'll get a different sound, you know, or just in the break or something. So there's that snare, and then there's a really crappy snare here, but you know, you can, you can tune all of them differently. Uh, same thing with floor toms. I brought up the floor tom because oftentimes in, you, you record the drums and everything live, but then when you go back to do overdubs, we'll do floor tom overdubs because you want parts that are like boom, 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 to be, have a big impact. So you'll take the the regular drummer's floor tom and then another floor tom and you'll tune them slightly differently one a little bit lower than the other and then if you hit them together they have a deeper sort of bigger hit and then you know we just have stuff like cowbells and different sticks and things like uh you know these felt batters which you don't like you wouldn't have a rock drummer play with felt batters because it's just not loud enough and doesn't sound but if you're hitting floor toms you know you can hear the difference between and that, when you record that, that sounds a lot better, you know? And if you try to do like a swell on a, on a cymbal, it sounds tinky, but if you do it with, you know, you gotta have something like that, and then you have brushes, you know, so you can do like, uh, you know, like to, a lot of recording is, making a differentiated sounds in different parts to add dynamics to a song. So you might go back and, you know, overdub or which you can't do with a stick, you know, little things like that. So I've tried to just get some, uh, just different, just different sticks and batter sticks and stuff for percussion and, you know, egg shakers and tambourine and stuff like that. Um, this is, uh, analog tape and yeah, we can go in the analog tape room. And, yeah, the uh, pop filters, that's pop filters. Yeah, that's pop filters. And these are these, uh, short mic stands. These are good for like kick drum mm -hmm. and, and guitar amps. And then I have these, uh, crappy microphones. Actually, this microphone I built, it's just a really, really cheap microphone cartridge. That I think I paid 50 cents for at some <laughs> old electronic store. And I just wired it up to an XLR jack and it sounds horrible. And sometimes you want it to sound horrible because you want an effect like, uh, you know, like it, instead of, instead of in the computer running it through like a telephone mm -hmm. uh, filter, you actually just get the sound by using a really bad microphone, you know, and sometimes you got the cool. movie stuff here. This is all the film stuff. These yeah. are, this is a, uh, Russian made, but Bulgarian, uh, 
a 16 millimeter movie projector. It came from like Bulgarian schools from the probably the 80s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, and these are actually these are old uh, from uh, 35 millimeter projector reels from Chitalistes. Uh, Chitalistes. Mm-hmm. I, I always say that. I can't <laughs> pronounce that word right. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, lots of film stuff. There's a telecine here. Yeah, here's a movie. This, this is my very first film that I made in the United States uh, in 1999. And then this is the movie that we made in uh, in 2012. Um, yeah. This is Vasil. Yeah. And then uh, this is... Uh, you, she was uh, in Kadei Maggie. Remember this TV show, Kadei Maggie? Akademi. Yeah, yeah, it was on TV. It was a Bulgarian mm-hmm. TV show. She played Maggie. This is uh, Huben Nurev, and uh, he, you can see him on like Star Machine. He's a really funny guy, really cool. Actually, quite a good actor. Plays a bad guy. This is a uh, Gogi Zotarov, George Zotarov, and uh, he's r- really great, actually. Uh, and uh, Manuela. And so this was um, this was uh, they made this for uh, when they showed it yeah. to Vlika Tornopol. Okay, and we are going to the other room. Yeah, so um, microphones and cables uh, and headphones in the box down there. Um, guitar effects pedals and guitar chords. And uh, and then a really cheap steel string guitar. And even cheaper, it's a 50 leva crappy mm-hmm. nylon string guitar that I bought, at, I think at Hotnitsa, at some little store. And it's a terrible guitar, but it, if you tune it right, you're careful. It sounds okay. Uh, this is a, a, a Studio Master. It's from 1987, and I got this at this old, old store run in that's in Sofia. And this guy has nothing but really old audio equipment. And I bought it. I think it was 150 leva, and that's I nothing. took it all apart and cleaned it and fixed a bunch of it. And I actually need to go through, I was, I'm going to reorder pots. I'm going to get all new pots uh, and new faders for the whole board and replace all of them and new ICs. Because even though I cleaned up some of the pots, they're still a little dirty. Yeah. But this board sounds really good. It's got EQ bypasses and it has uh, mutes and it has multiple sends. And it, mm-hmm. it actually sounds fantastic. It's really uh, transparent. Uh, and the EQs sound really good. And you can see it's labeled a lot of things like this channel's dead and, you know. Yeah. But we just tracked the bass hunters through this uh, into the analog tape machine. Um, so this is a Biamp console. I used to work at Biamp many, many years ago, which is a company in Portland, Oregon. And they, back way back in the, I think they started in the 70s, they started making power amps and even recording mixers. And the cool thing about this, the same as well with that. This is from 1983, I think. Um, but this is a much simpler mixer than that. Mm-hmm. This is nowadays, if you were to look inside a mixer, there's just one big PC board. It actually looks just like the inside of a computer as a mo- they call it a motherboard. And the reason that new mixers don't generally sound as good as old mixers is because all the components are microscopic and they're surface mount and they're on one big board. So they're also harder to fix. But these old mixers, if you were to open the back up, you'd see that each channel has its own printed circuit board. Mm -hmm. And then they're wired together with a bus so that not only can you take one out and fix it and put it back in and move them around, but they have less crosstalk between channels. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and this, the cool thing with the Biamp is that it has input transformers on it, uh, which give it a different sound, you know. Uh, and more isolation from the microphone, but it's a, a very more organic. It's not like a gain. It's a, no, it, it's just that, it's completely just that different. Instead of going directly into the integrated circuit that's in the beginning, this has uh, input transformers. So it's it's transformer isolated, which is a very different sound in the microphone mm. preamp. Then, yeah. Um, and, and then this is this is my guitar. This is an old Dean, uh, but I. I love it. Plays really well. This is a Vox Valtronics. Uh, it's it's a it's a modeling amp, and it has a bunch of old Vox amp modelings in it. And I'm not a big mm-hmm. fan of modeling amps, but this one actually has a little AX7 12 12 AX7 tube in it. it. Sounds really good, but it sounds best when you turn it all the way up, and it gets really loud. And so it, the best part of it is when the speaker sounds like it's just falling apart. <laughs> um, this is a, a very cheap bass, but it yeah. it sounds real good. Um, yeah. This is 
a really music man. great amp. Yeah. This is a 1975 Music Man 212 HD. It's 130. So this is standby. This is 65 watts, and that's 130 watts. <laughs> so um, it's 212s, and then this was the amp that Leo Fender, after he got basically kicked out of Fender Music, he started Music Man. This was the amp that he always wanted to make. Mm -hmm. And the difference is that the, the, it had, it's a hybrid amp. The input section, instead of being tube, is uh, is solid state. It's but it's metal can, round metal can op amps. They sound very different than chip op amps. And then it has four power tubes in it that are matched. And the difference is like on a Marshall stack when you go half power, fifty watts, full power, one hundred watts. What happens is you go use the two tubes and then when you do full power you use four tubes on this you use all four tubes at 500 volts plate voltage and then you use all four tubes at 750 volts plate voltage so the tubes last longer and they stay better matched and the amp sounds better i modified this so that it gets more distortion out of the distortion channel by mm -hmm. changing one of the resistors in the feedback loop uh, and then there's a custom built foot switch that uh runs out but I'll, i also built this so mm -hmm. it has a channel switching, which it didn't, doesn't originally have channel switching. So now you can just go in here instead of having to have an AB switch on the ground and go in. But it's also got string yeah, reader in it. Yeah. And then there's a 412 cabinet that um, I matched up with it. So it's 612s. It's, it's louder than a Marshall. It's really, really <laughs> loud, but it sounds fantastic. And we actually recorded um, all the guitar solos on the um, and a bunch of the clean sounds on the Mace Hunters records with this. Um, Instead of the AC-15, which... Uh, and you got uh, an old Russian piano here. Yeah. And American mini piano. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> just... controller. <laughs> I just have this uh, just for, like, um, movie soundtrack stuff and, like, sound effects because uh -huh. there's not really enough... There's not enough octaves on here to do anything. Yeah. yeah. You know, you can't... And, uh, and I'm just learning to play piano myself, so I just... I just write on this, you know. I've I've only written two songs. Yeah, you can so see far. here some songs. Yeah, yeah. I'm just. I'm We're just, not showing them. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm just now. I'm just now working on a couple of songs that I'm writing for this, you know. Why on the piano? You're a guitar man. Guitar yeah, player. but you know, we can the, the compose cool, on guitar. The cool thing is that when you when you change instruments, you start writing different songs. Uh -huh. You know. Like when you when you when you play an instrument, you kind of get into a thing where you always sort of play the same style, especially on guitar. If you listen to one guitar player, he kind of has a style. Another guitar player, she has a style, and, it, and it's you know there's yeah, not yeah. you get sort of stuck there, and you, then you, all your songs sort of start kind of the same. You you call that style? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know, but if you switch instruments to try to write a song in a new instrument, then it sounds very different, you know. So yeah. that's that's been good. I'm I'm just you know like I'm a really bad player because I'm having sort of like it. you'd think that it would be helpful like if you knew how to play one instrument that it would translate to another. It's mm. helpful, <laughs> but it's not. You know you still get like I still am making you know like mistakes all the yeah, time. Yeah. So I'm just kind of practicing on that. But I can <laughs> show you the the tape. Um, so you would. Um, Most people would think that you would put the tape over here, um, and then you would put the take up reel on the other side. And on a normal tape machine or like on a cassette, that's what you would do. Yeah, the, yeah. But on on a multi track machine, you wrap what's called tails out, and it says, "See, top tails out, Maze Hunter's reel one." And the reason is that um, is that you you put this on and then you rewind it all and then you play from the beginning. You see? Because uh, there's a thing called print through, which means that the tape uh, sits there and it and it it'll end up copying the the signal from one layer to the next layer. Mm -hmm. So you get like a little echo. Mm -hmm. And if you keep it wrapped on the supply reel and then the then the um, the print through, which is what we call that, when the mm -hmm, mm -hmm. music goes from one layer to another layer, mm -hmm. the print through will be ahead of the song instead of behind the song. Um, so when you play it, you'll start you know, like you'll hear before the yeah, first yeah, note yeah, starts. Yeah, yeah. You'll hear it from the next rap, 
So we wrap it tails out on on multi track tape. Okay. So then, yeah. So you would you would go through and you wrap this around, and then you've got you know eight tracks on the heads. You've got a record head, a playback head, and an erase head, and then you've got a counter, and and then you've got a, the ability to select each track. You know. Yeah. So it would you know. It's difficult to maintain. That's what I. Um. Mean. It's n- it's not. It's actually not that difficult to maintain. First off, there's so many, many years and years of documentation, uh, and there's of all different kinds of these sort of tape machines, eight track, uh, 16 track, 24 track, you know, and you have to realize that every single day, everywhere, you're hearing Beatles songs. And yeah, all true. the Beatles songs were recorded on, uh, most of them were recorded on four track yeah. analog tape, and only the later ones were recorded on eight track. So, if you think that you can't record an album on analog tape and you can't record an album on four tracks, you know, then you're wrong. You just, you know, have, you just haven't done your homework. Um, I, I read about Eurythmics. They mm-hmm. recorded uh, uh, Sweet Dreams on 8-track. Yeah. And the tape, not a... a yeah, a, a, a on a cassette. cassette. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I, so, our, for the, my first band, our first record was recorded on 4-track cassette, dumped down to be 8-tracks. Yeah. And it sounds great. This thing sounds fantastic. The diff, the, one of the nice things is it it's much more forgiving than digital. So if you... Um, if you hit this all the way up to zero dB and then you go past it um, and you go over, if you do that in the computer, once you get over this, once you get over the top here, yeah. it's distortion and yeah. you're done. It's and distorted it's a and digital it sounds, distortion. And it sounds horrible. Yeah. But you can hit this where you're pegging the needle all the way down and it still sounds still great. Sounds, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you rewind the tape and then you'd. Uh, That. Do you still find easy? Do, do you find the tapes? These are brand new. You can actually buy. They started yeah, there's a new company called RNG. Produce. Okay. And this is a, uh, the same formulation as Ampex. Um, uh, that doesn't 499. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they call it uh, RMG 900, but it's basically the same thing. But yeah, if you. So then you choose what you, which head you want to, so you can hit, you can see that, you know, like this is the kick drum, right? The snare drum, room, and you can see how hot these levels are, they're really hot, mm-hmm. you know, but that is not distorting, even though it looks like it's pegging, you know? So you've got a lot of, same thing with the, with the analog console, you've got a lot of forgiveness, you can really drive the console hard. And it just keep it you just got more good. harmonics actually. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's so. the other thing about the input transformers on the microphone, mm-hmm. uh, the mixing houses, the input transformers. You get you get different harmonics and you get nicer second overtones. You know. Yeah. yeah. So, but then uh, now I'm actually editing this digitally because I don't have automation on the mixing console. Mm-hmm. Uh, normally, what you'd have is there's a simpty time code that would run out of the time on the tape and yeah. run into a mixing console with a special simply time code cable mm-hmm. and then a mixing console would have the faders would be automated they'd actually fly up and down by themselves and then yeah. the mutes would also be automated and if you had mute and and fader automation which is you have in big studios and big recording consoles but that just the adding the automation to recording consoles very expensive yeah even 8 10 12 channels is very expensive so uh so one of the one of the disadvantages to analog is that it's hard to edit on, and you can't edit individual tracks very well, uh, and you can't do automation unless you have a very expensive console. So we take all the advantages of analog, which is that it sounds better when you record on it, and you can hit it harder, uh, uh, and you're constrained to eight tracks, which is really helpful when you're trying to record a band because you only have eight tracks, and they're now limited within scope. So you have to do eight really great tracks instead of 
500, unli- unlimited number yeah, of garbage unlimited. tracks, which yeah. is what most productions are now. You know, and as a mixing engineer, yeah. you, you are thinking, where the hell should I put yeah. the number 435? Yeah, so if, if you listen to like Beyonce or somebody, you know, she's going to sing 100 takes of something yeah. and then they'll edit it down to one take, you know. But this, I've, you know, the singer's got, a, he's got two tracks. He's got one track and then he's got another track. And then when he's not singing on the other track, then, you know, we can put maybe a percussion overdub, you know. But we're doing three tracks of drums, room Room, one room mic, one snare, snare drum mic, and one kick drum mic. That's three tracks of drums, and most drums are, you know, 10, 15 tracks, yeah. sometimes eight tracks, you know, and then it's guitar, guitar, bass, vocals, you know, and then you've basically got one track left over. So yeah, you, but that's yeah. how they sound live, how they play live. Exactly. They yeah. don't have 15 yeah. guitars, so. Yeah, so then, so when we get it into the computer, Basically, we can break it up, and then um, and then you have to do stuff like uh, making sure that your levels are all correct, so that um, your oh, when all the tracks mix together, they don't blow out the because the worst thing you want to do in a computer mixing thing is to is to hit it too hard because you mm-hmm. you know. So right now, what I just started working on was um, making sure that the levels don't without a compressor, without a limiter on the master channel, that they don't ever hit higher than minus 3 dB. So when you send it to a mastering engineer, they, they want to have enough headroom to, so that they have room to do their compression job to make yeah, it yeah. sound good yeah. on different yeah. things. So, so this is, you know, without that. They're rough. Yeah, and then if you were to go in here and turn on a mastering limiter, You can see that the level is now, mm-hmm. you know, it says louder, right? And this is with no, there's no effects, there's no EQ, Nothing, that's the rough mix. It's totally yeah, raw. That's rough. All I've really Just done balancing is, the, yeah, yeah, all the I've levels. really done is certain places where we did like tom overdubs and tambourine overdubs on the other, on the original eight tracks, I've just moved those to different tracks mm-hmm. so that they're easier to deal with. Because the EQ and the level and things mm-hmm. like that will be exactly. different. Yeah. But you can hear. Uh, That's the, the drums, yeah? So, that's the live drums. Two tracks live drum. And they sound great. Tracks. Yeah. You know? And and they sound natural. Yeah, and they sound and it's you know, and you can you can hear the band in the background playing. Yeah. Just a little bit. You know. But really if you can't uh, if you can't get it with a couple of microphones, then you just haven't spent time you haven't spent time tuning your drums and you haven't spent time putting the microphone in the right place. You know? I I've done a lot of recording sessions where there's been, you know, 15 microphones on the drums, a microphone top and bottom of each tom, two room mics, you know, two overheads, two to, snare mics. In the, in the corridor. <laughs> yeah, and then you mix them all together and they don't sound half as good as this. Hmm. You know, that sounds like, like it's supposed to. And that's no editing at all. Again, there's no, there's no reverb. I mean, that's just room, you know. And we're recording where... It's just, uh, you know, tile floors. Yeah. So yeah. there's lots of... Uh, but, a lot, then, the, yeah. yeah, the rooms are life. What they call it, life room. Yeah. Uh, and it's not just too late. Yeah. So then there's... Uh, these little tiny speakers. Oh, yeah. And the, the point of those is that these are studio monitors and they sound mm-hmm. good. You know, they've got their own amps and they're, and they're very well matched. But mm-hmm. these sound terrible. And that's the point is that they sound that's terrible. The point. They have no bass response. You know, they're little computer speakers. They're made to, to, for video games and they're ter- You know, they, there's no subwoofer. And the point is that you go back and forth between the good speakers, the crappy speakers and the headphones and you try to get a, that they that it sounds pretty good in all all three of those places. We know the story yeah. about the Yamaha in its two ten. <laughs> yeah. They've been hi-fi speakers since suddenly. Yeah, they're yeah, a yeah. standard in the 
music. Yeah, and then you know, there's a headphone amp which just goes through the wall, uh -huh. and you know, so you can. There's just instead of having a normal patch plate, I just, I just, you know, because we're recording in a house, so it's easy to do it in the, in the thing. So, um, yeah. So that's that's really it's it's really basic, really basic setup to be able to record. Yeah. Um, yeah. Without mm -hmm. having to, uh, if you were gonna do, if you're gonna do a whole, you could, you could do a whole record here, um, but if you had, if you had a, a, you know, a bigger budget, you would probably go to a, you know, a more. You always go yeah. to bigger. <laughs> but the nice thing that recording out here is that there's nothing else to do. You know, the the problem with a lot of recording studios is that they're in cities and they're underground and they're full of uh, because they're in cities, they're so the city's so noisy that every single wall has to be soundproofed. So they're usually like underground where there's no light, you know, you can't see out the window. And then you've got all this foam on the walls and you go in there and you spend a few days and usually what's called 24 hour lockout, which is where you go buy, you know, it's just many hundreds of dollars or euros per day, 24 hours a day in the studio. And then you get, you know, so you're, you're there and then you go, you go to the bar and go drinking and then you come back and then the music starts to suck, you know. But if you go someplace where, you know, like there's nobody here, we don't really have to worry about, you know, making noise. None, none of this stuff needs to be soundproofed and there's nothing to do but record and look at the view. So, you know, I'll make a picture of the view now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's... OK, thank you. Sure. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. It was really interesting. Hope you didn't run over. <laughs> <laughs>